Good evening and welcome to Wednesdays in the Word, the weekly online study of the Bible hosted by Lebanon Rock Church. I'm Pastor Matt Skiles and we want to welcome you to this evening's study for this Wednesday, June the 12th, 2024. We are continuing with our current study series from the book of First and Second Thessalonians and now we've completed the study of First Thessalonians. Now we're going to be looking at lesson number six tonight which is going to be the introduction and first part of chapter 1, and that, of course, is from the book of 2 Thessalonians. So, as always, I want to remind you to make sure you brought your Bible or your tablet or your smartphone, uh, whatever your Bible app is tonight, and I have my coffee right here close by as well. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer, then we're going to get into this lesson tonight, which will be a little bit shorter than normal. Uh, because we're going to just do a quick review of what we talked about uh, in the previous book of First Thessalonians, and then we're going to segue into uh, looking at chapter 1 of this second book of Thessalonians. So join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer and invite God's blessing and presence into our study. Join with me as we pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come together again tonight here and study this wonderful second book of Thessalonians. We thank you for the depth and the knowledge and the understanding that we've already gleaned so far, and we pray that you'll bless our study tonight. We pray that you'll give your word free course in our hearts and our lives. Bless each and every one that is joining with us here online, and we pray you'll bless our in-person study as well. And we give you thanks and praise and glory and honor, for it is in Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. All right, let's go to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And by way of introduction and review, if you remember, we have been looking at this um, first letter that Paul wrote. The first Thessalonians is his first letter or epistle to the Thessalonian church. And as you remember, uh, it had been written in response to the news that was brought back by Timothy, who had made a trip there while Paul was in Athens. Uh, we read that in 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 1 through 3, and then later in verse 6 of 1 Thessalonians 3. And Paul, as you know, went into Thessalonica and he preached for three Sabbaths, basically three weeks, and had helped to establish the church, had made many converts, many prominent, well-known people in that city had come to salvation, had became Christians, were being converted. And then Paul met with resistance. And as Paul experienced throughout his life in um, ministry as an apostle and as a missionary, Paul would often face backlash and resistance and persecution. And so after three weeks, Paul had to be whisked away in the middle of the night, basically snuck out of the city of Thessalonica, so that way he could go somewhere where he could be safe. So that's why he ended up in Athens. He sent Timothy and Silvanius back to Thessalonica to find out how the new church was getting along. And they reported back very, very good news. So that's what Paul was writing his first letter in response to was the news that he had received from Timothy and Sylvanius. Now, uh, in this second letter, which we're going to look at, which is shorter in context, but just as significant, it appears that the believers in Thessalonica, they remained strong in the Lord, even though they were going through persecution, which we're going to look at here in lesson one. But also, it's apparent from this letter that misunderstanding about the Lord's coming was present in the church and there was some confusion in the church regarding when Jesus would come, how they were to live their life uh, in light of the coming of the Lord. And some of the members uh, were being troubled by false prophets and false reports while others had stopped simply serving and working, perhaps assuming that the Lord's imminent return meant one did not need to work anymore. <clears throat> now, Paul's purpose in writing this second epistle really is threefold. First of all, to encourage the Thessalonians in their steadfastness under persecution, which they were dealing with. Number two, 
to correct their misunderstanding about the imminence of the Lord's return, and thirdly, to instruct the congregation on what disciplinary action to take toward those who refuse to work, because Paul was dealing with the first signs or the first hints here of possible problems within the church. Now, the Thessalonian church uh, was a very strong church. It was a, a church that consisted of new converts, young Christian believers, people that were new to the faith, but they were strong in their faith, even though they were facing persecution, even though they were dealing with being ostracized and, and treated very harshly and unfairly, they still persevered. But we see in the second letter, over the course of time, um, there were some false reports, maybe some false teaching uh, that was being spoke that, that maybe brought some, some confusion or misunderstanding in the congregation. They were confused about the coming of the Lord and the Lord's return. And then, of course, there were some that said, well, if Jesus is coming, then why continue the work of the Great Commission? Why keep doing what we're doing? And that's what Paul stands to address here. So let's look here at our first point, and that's this, the theme of this epistle. Now, remember, Paul was trying to correct the misunderstanding about the return of Christ. And so Paul explains that the Lord will not come right away. And we're going to look at that in next week's lesson. Um, but Paul did stress there that that while Christ's return was imminent, there would be some characteristics that would mark the, the signs and the days and the events leading up to um, the coming of the Lord. So Paul is saying to the Thessalonians that they need to continue with steadfastness and patience. Um, and that's what he had commended them for earlier. That's what he had spoken about earlier. So he was just telling him, just keep doing what you're doing. Don't get sidetracked by what you're hearing and seeing, because none of that is true anyway. And so really, I guess the suggested theme of this epistle would be steadfastness while waiting for the coming of Christ. And of course, we see the key verse of this entire letter is found in 2 Thessalonians 2, 15 through 17. We'll talk about it next week as well. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So that's really what Paul is saying in this letter to the Thessalonians. He is telling them, hold on, remain faithful, stand true, and stay dedicated to what it is that you've been called to do. So let's look at uh, our second point tonight, and that is the introduction that Paul gives to them in this letter and the encouragement in their persecution. So we're going to look at the first four verses of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And as you find that, we're going to look at our first sub-point there. Again, this is the introduction and encouragement to the Thessalonians in spite of persecution. So the first sub-point is Paul is thankful for their spiritual growth. And in 2 Thessalonians 1, 1 through 4, Paul says to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So Paul greeted and saluted the church in Thessalonica, and Paul praised them again for their growing faith despite their tremendous persecution. Paul also praised the Thessalonians for their abounding love toward each other, which was a direct answer uh, to Paul's prayer that he prayed in 1 Thessalonians 3 and 12. Now, rather than living according to their own self-interest here, the Thessalonians reached out to one another and, and helped to build up one another. And that's what Paul's commending them for. Paul is telling them, I'm very thankful for you, and I commend you for, for what you're doing. 
I've said this before and I'll say it again. The church of Thessalonica probably wasn't as big as some of the other churches, especially the church in Ephesus, for example. And it probably didn't have nearly, um, you know, have nearly the number of people. Uh, but it was, I think, in my humble opinion, probably the strongest of the churches that Paul helped to birth and establish because it didn't have the problems that you read about in Galatia or uh, in Corinth or what you read in Colossae, or what you see in Ephesus. Uh, what you see here um, in these particular writings of Paul to the churches, Paul was addressing a problem or issues or struggles in some churches, like the Corinthian church, it was a cesspool, I'm sorry. It was just a cesspool of, of sin and corruption and carnality, which Paul had to deal with, and Paul would never have known that unless the report from the house of Chloe came to him, which is why he then addressed that. Paul would always hear reports from people regarding the circumstances or situations uh, regarding the churches that he was writing to. The church in Rome was much different than the church in Ephesus. Uh, they had problems and they had struggles, obviously. But the church of the Thessalonians, Paul really, really had a heart for these people because he commends them and talks about their love, and talks about how they endure, and how they remain strong in spite of the persecution. And you see that. You see that in the Thessalonians. It wasn't an older church or more established church, but it was a growing church, a loving church, a faithful church. And Paul was encouraged by that. Paul was strengthened by that. It gave Paul a lot of hope and a great deal of satisfaction to know that the Thessalonians were continuing. He wrote them in the first letter about all the good things he had heard and how happy he was for what they were doing. Now in the second letter, you read where Paul is really commending them and saying, I thank God that, and you notice there, he says there very, very clearly in verse three, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, and as, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other. So he's saying your faith is growing and your love is growing. That is a wonderful thing to say about a church, that it's full of love and that it's full of faith and that it's growing. And so we see here where he, he obviously he, he addresses them, introduces himself again, salutes them, and then he, of course, encourages them in their persecution. So that takes us to our second sub point here. And that is Paul's encouragement in trials in view of the Lord's return. So let's look at verses 5 through 10. And notice what Paul writes here. Which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So Paul shared with the Thessalonians that their sufferings would be repaid by God because God is just. He will ultimately right every wrong and repay with tribulation those who persecute the righteous. And this will happen when the Lord returns to the earth again. And that's very, very important because Paul was saying, don't be overwhelmed. And we'll talk more about this in, in next week's lesson when we uh, focus on chapter 2. Paul was telling them here in the scriptures um, that, we're going, that we're suffering or we're enduring these things, but not to panic or to worry because God was ultimately going to repay when the Lord returned in his power with his angels. That speaks, of course, again of the second coming of Christ. The church, of course, is going to be raptured, which we're going to focus on and talk about a little bit next week. But again, Paul is saying to the Thessalonians here 
that they need to continually remain steadfast in light of Christ's return. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. We don't know when the Lord is going to return. Jesus said, for as the lightning comes from the east and shines forth from the west, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus also said, watch and be ready, for the Son of Man comes in the hour that you think not. So in the moment that you least expect Christ to return, that is when he will return. We are living in the season of the coming of the Lord. We're living in the time when Jesus warned us uh, to be ready. We can't simply look around and see the signs and the prophecies that have come to pass and the prophetical signs that have, um, that have begun to come to fruition. All of those are road signs pointing us to the rapture of the church and the coming of the lords in the clouds. Now, there's a big difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. Paul is speaking here to the Thessalonians, telling them you're struggling and suffering and going through this, but there is a day of vengeance and a day of judgment coming. God will repay. It's just like the Old Testament tells us. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. We're not to render evil for evil, as Paul wrote, but we're to overcome evil with good. So for us as believers in 2024, just like 2,000 years ago, the church of the Thessalonians was dealing with persecution and difficulty and struggle. We have to continually remain steadfast. And so Paul is encouraging the Thessalonian church. He's telling them that we need to be ready. He's telling them you need to be prepared and, and, stay, st and stay strong in your faith, stay firm in your foundation in the word of God and in your life, and do not look to the left hand or to the right, but look upon him. That's what's so important. That's why it is vital that even though we're living in very difficult times and we're living in the last days and we're looking for the coming of the Lord and we're anticipating the, the rapture of the church, we have to live each day faithfully and remain steadfast to the Lord. That's what Paul is saying here to the Thessalonians. He is reminding them of what he said in his first letter. He circles back, so to speak, and encourages them a second time. And says, this is important. You have to understand this. You have to realize this. Because the Thessalonians were facing that. And like Christians today, the Thessalonians were dealing with a hostile culture, a society, and, 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 and a community, and a city, and a nation, and, 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 a, and obviously a culture that did not like them, that hated them. But they remained faithful and steadfast and true. So that takes us to our third sub-point here. And that is Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians. So let's look at verse 11 and 12. And Paul writes, Therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul continues to stress here to the Thessalonians that he continues to always pray for them. Paul's prayer is that they would be counted worthy of this calling of service to the Lord. Paul reminds the Thessalonians that trials do not make us what we are. Instead, they reveal what we are as believers. Paul tells the Thessalonians that for the that for they for the Thessalonians to be counted worthy of God's calling in their lives, they should live in harmony with their ultimate spiritual destiny. Just knowing that we're living in the light of the coming of the Lord, we're living in the season of the coming of the Lord, that should encourage us and inspire us to live with to live for the Lord and to walk with the Lord and to serve Him faithfully, because. The Thessalonians belonged to Christ and are bound for their home in heaven. So they should live by faith and remain faithful to the Lord until the end. That comes back to what Jesus said in the scriptures in Matthew 24 when he warned about the signs of his coming, the events that would mark the end of days, the circumstances on the earth that would, that would uh, proceed 
the coming of the Lord. I mean, there's nothing now that would hinder the Lord Jesus from coming back in the clouds and, and rapturing the church. Some people say, well, Pastor Skiles, you, you taught us in Revelation that that the Antichrist is going to go into the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. There's no temple being rebuilt. That's true. That's true. But you have to understand that the, that the Antichrist will go into the temple in the middle of the tribulation period. So it would take not very much time at all to build that temple as far as the, the, the Holy of Holies and the inner court. And then, of course, the outer court would follow. Um, you know, the Israeli people already have everything they need. It's, it's, it's underground uh, in the catacombs of the city of, of Jerusalem. They already have every stone that's marked and numbered. And as soon as they have the okay, that temple is going to be erected and built, and it will be built in a matter of weeks, if not months. And so there's nothing that would preclude the, the, uh, the Jewish people and the nation of Israel from doing that. And, you know, they're in a war right now. They're in a conflict in the Gaza Strip and, and fighting with the Palestinians. And, you know, it's not outlandish. It's not, um, uh, it's not even naive to think that if this conflict continues, they're striving to, to work out a peaceful resolution. But uh, if something were to happen where, where things escalated, the Israelis have the firepower, the military capability, the technology, and the intelligence to probably wipe out, um, the, uh, wipe out not only Hamas, but a lot of the terrorist groups and people that are enemies of them. And they could easily, easily uh, take over parts of, of the holy city Jerusalem and rebuild that temple. Don't think that God doesn't already have a timetable and a plan because he does. But knowing that we're living in that season of the coming of the Lord, we should be ready because Jesus could come and the trumpet of God will sound and the dead in Christ will rise first and we that are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet them in the air. We talked about that in our previous uh, study in First Thessalonians. Now here in Second Thessalonians, Paul is saying, you know what's coming, you know what's going to happen. So let's live for the Lord. Let's remain steadfast and faithful. And of course, knowing that, that should inspire us and encourage us to live for the Lord and walk with Jesus Christ. And also too, remember that Jesus said, he that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. There is signs everywhere that are pointing us to the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ coming in the clouds, the trumpet of God sounds, and the catching away of the saints, and the catching away of the church. Then comes the seven years of tribulation that follow, and at the end of that seven-year period, then we see the day of the Lord, which Paul alludes to here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And Christ will come back with his angels, with his wrath, with his fury, and he will destroy the works of the enemy and destroy the works of man. So knowing all that, we need to make sure we have the right mindset, the right attitude, the right lifestyle, and that we are living according to what the Word of God tells us. So let's look at our conclusion tonight. And it says here, again, just want to remind you, remember, this is Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. And it's really a continuation of his encouragement to them to live faithfully despite persecution and suffering. His continuous prayer for the church in Thessalonica was an encouragement to them, and he also helped them continue to remain faithful to the Lord despite their suffering. So that concludes our lesson for tonight. We're going to pick up next next week, and we're going to do uh, chapters two and three to tie it all together and bring it all to a conclusion um, next week, uh, because that letter is a little bit shorter than the first letter. But I want to encourage you to hear this lesson tonight and put it into practice and continue to remain steadfast in the Lord despite the persecutions we're facing in these last days. So join with me as we bring our study tonight to a close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity that we've had to come together tonight here on this Wednesday evening and study this wonderful, wonderful book of Second Thessalonians. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look at Paul's words to the church in Thessalonica. Lord, help us to remain steadfast and true. Help us to endure until the end. For Lord, we're living in very, very perilous times. We're living in the day and the age and the season of the coming of the Lord. Lord, help us to remain close to you. 
and help us to walk faithfully with you. And Father, we pray that you'll bring us, Lord, closer to you through the study of 2 Thessalonians. And Father, help us to live for you in spite of whatever difficulties or circumstances we face. Father, we pray you'll bless us the remainder of this week, prosper us and keep us in health, even as our souls prosper. And Father, we're careful to give you all thanks and praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you and thank you for joining with us tonight. Just a quick reminder that our Father's Day brunch is this coming Sunday, June the 16th at 1030. We'll be gathering in our annex for a very casual worship gathering and a beautiful time of uh, fellowship as we honor our fathers, share a very special Father's Day homily, and enjoy a wonderful Father's Day brunch. We will not be having a Sunday evening service or Sunday school, or our regular breakfast. We're just doing the Father's Day brunch this coming Sunday. So if you want to, you're welcome to join us online for our online worship service, which will be available this coming Sunday at 1045. So from all of us here at Lebanon Rock Church, we want to wish a happy Father's Day to all of our dads out there. We pray you have a blessed week and a prosperous week. God be with you, and we look forward to seeing you all back with us next time.